Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. Would you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Get in touch with us to hatch a new plan. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. This week we travel to Whitehall and learn about kombucha. It's a fermented tea that's becoming quite popular. Then Chris Mullins shows us how to grow eggplant from the ground up. We'll also have the Ag Calendar, a Minute in the Field video, and of course the Ag News of the Week, all on this edition of Virginia Farming. Governor Terry McAuliffe has announced that Virginia's agricultural exports, which also include Virginia forestry products, reached $3.19 billion last year. Now that's a 4.7% decrease from the previous year's all-time high. But even so, the Commonwealth has strengthened its position as the second largest exporter of agricultural goods on the East Coast and narrowed the gap between first place Georgia. Well, 12 youth who exhibited beef cattle, sheep, meat goats, or swine in last year's State Fair of Virginia 4-H and FFA Youth Livestock Program were awarded scholarships from the fair's Applied Youth Livestock Scholarship Program. A total of $12,680 in scholarship funds was awarded to the participants on your screen. Judging was based on participation in livestock shows during the fair, as well as on leadership and community service activities and an essay. Funds allocated for the scholarships represent a portion of proceeds from the revived Sale of Champions Benefit Auction held October 10th of last year. Well, STEM is a curriculum based on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Carroll County High School has a modern STEM lab where students are taking agricultural learning to a whole new level. Dave Miller has more. Carroll County High School is in the mountains of southwest Virginia. It's no surprise that the Ag Technology Program at the school is important in this rural community. What makes it unique is that it's the first high school science lab focused on agriculture in the nation. The modern science, technology, engineering, and math lab will prepare students for new types of farming with biotechnology with real-world applications, like growing corn that is insect-resistant. We have done lots of experiments in here. We've extracted DNA from certain plants and feed off their GMOs. We've done E. coli and coliform testing. We went to Virginia Tech and went to the water testing lab there and they showed us how to do coliform testing when you put the water in this, it's like a packet thing and then you add a powder to it and it turns it yellow if there's coliform and then you put it under a black light and if it glows there's E. coli in it. The STEM lab is very, very important to Carroll County. It's going to help open many doors for scientists to come out of Carroll County and uh, uh, get into col better colleges for chemistry and biology and biotechnology and everything that we, uh, everything that the STEM lab has gave us the opportunity for, veterinary science, all of it. The half a million dollar lab allows students to explore all types of agriculture careers, not just vocational agriculture. The students at Carroll County High School recognize they have a rare opportunity and are eager to take advantage of it. What I'm doing um, with the Save Our Streams SOS, it's to take stream surveys of local streams um, and try and figure out how healthy they are by looking at the animal life within them. Um, they take sweep nets and they pull them through the creeks and streams and then they bring them up to the surface and then they sort through them and look for different insects. More of the flies like uh, caddis flies or mayflies or stoneflies, then your stream's um, really healthy. But if you have leeches or worms, then your stream wouldn't be so healthy. Carroll County students have visited laboratories at Virginia Tech, 
to witness experiments that they then recreated in their own classroom with their own materials. The students in this class have really uh, learned what genetically modified organisms are, which we hear it talked about all the time in the news. Um, they actually understand what they are and um, how they help us, and um, they're actually able to do some of the experiments that the early biotechnologists did. Um, so for doing things like extracting DNA and um, um, looking for GMO markers and plants, um, some of these really cutting edge experiments these students are able to do in the high school classroom. Um, those are some of the things, you know, I didn't see until college and, you know, maybe even grad school, but these students are getting exposed to it here in high school. There are plenty of classroom lectures and tests, but the hands-on experience they get in the state-of-the-art lab is what really excites these students. Okay, so this lab that we did was actually a model of a experiment done with recombinant DNA and what we did was we took the DNA and we made it resistant, uh, the bacteria resistant to an antibiotic so that it can grow even though that antibiotic is present. Um, this right here is the electrophoresis gel and what you do is there's actually bands that you can see when you put it underneath the light so you're seeing the DNA that you put in it. But it's not all academic study. The new lab offers students a chance to both conduct research and bring their findings back to the communities they live in and nearby farms. A lot of people think uh, the food comes from the grocery store and they don't really understand anymore how it gets to the grocery store. Um, the students in Carroll County are um, playing a role in, uh, from the ground up so to speak, um, actually planting these crops in the field, um, actually uh, understanding um, uh, how to grow better products, um, understanding how to grow safer products. Um, so they understand where our food comes from and uh, they'll play a role in, in the future of our food production in this country. With a world population of more than 9 billion people on the horizon, American and Virginia farmers will have to grow food more efficiently. The students and teachers at Carroll County High are in the first wave of students actively engaged in this process. They are getting a head start on learning the research skills that will make a difference in modern agriculture. In Carroll County, Virginia, this is Dave Miller. Thanks, Dave. Kombucha is an ancient drink that's gaining in popularity. Today we talk with Peter Roderick and find out how they make mountain culture kombucha. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. Today we're in Whitehall, Virginia, and we're visiting mountain culture kombucha. And I'm joined by owner Peter Roderick. Peter, thank you so much for having us out today. Thank you, Amy, for coming. So explain to me a little bit, what is kombucha? So kombucha is... The short answer is that it's a fermented tea. Really what it is, it's a very similar process to making beer. However, instead of alcohol being the end result, it's probiotics. So we start with green tea. You could use green, black, oolong tea, any kind of actual tea leaves. And then we use organic evaporated cane juice for our fermentable sugar. So what we do is we brew a tea as if, just like you were brewing a cup of tea at home, only a lot bigger and then we add our sugar to it, and then what we do is we add our live culture of kombucha into these tanks where we do our main fermenting here, and then they're fermented out, and from there we add, we pump them up the hill into the trailer where you saw earlier with the bright tanks, so that's where we add flavors and make them cold. And the big thing about making them cold is since it's naturally effervescent, in order to get it into this bottle, it really has to be cold, otherwise it just bubbles everywhere. So, and you don't really get much liquid in the bottle, it's just all foam. Yeah, just be all foam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what kombucha is, is fermented tea that results in a lot of probiotics. And it also, you get organic acids, that's kind of where the tart taste comes from. So okay. So that's all part of it. So how did you come to the decision where, okay, you know what, we're going to start brewing kombucha. How did that all come about? So I guess it probably really all started over a decade ago. My mom, when I was probably about 11, handed me a bottle of kombucha and said, you're drinking this whether or not you like it, and just because it's good for you. So, you know, I definitely remember the first sip was like, wow, that's weird. Do I like that? And, you know, fast forward a few years later, and I was 
you know, out on my own and drinking it all the time and just trying all the different brands I could find. There weren't that many back then. And eventually just started, you know, I got so into drinking it, enjoying it, and the way it made me feel that I wanted to make it myself. And finally found someone that had a culture that I could get my hands on to actually start producing it. And it took about six to eight months of <laughs> trial and error and a lot, mostly error, to finally start getting something that I wanted to drink. And then that sort of turned into just making it for myself for a long time. And eventually, you know, I would share it with friends and family and they'd ask if they could, you know, take some bottles home or something. And so that sort of snowballed into doing 10 and 20 gallon batches on a really small scale, sort of delivering them to a few people, pretty much like the Milkman used to be, where I had returnable bottles and okay. people would pay like on a monthly basis. And then that sort of just snowballed to the point where me and Kelsey were sitting down one day and we were just like, you know, we should probably turn this into a real business, or at least try. Okay, and Kelsey's your partner. Yep. And when did you guys start Mountain Culture? We started in, we started working on figuring out what we would, I mean, it took forever just to even figure out what was required of, from the health department, the Department of Agriculture, and everything else. We started that process in the spring of 2012, and we finally got to the point where we had done all that and gotten our permits and everything else, and we were able to start selling at the Charlottesville Farmer's Market in the fall of 2012, September. That's right when we started off. Okay. So then what happened? At the Farmer's Market, it did it, it just took off? Yeah, it was pretty crazy. We... When we first started off, we were, you know, we were brewing about 40 gallons per week, and we were really worried if we were going to be able to sell it all. And then we went to the farmer's market the first time, and we were completely sold out two hours before the end of the market, and wow. had already and had been approached by four different buyers from local grocery stores who were like, I want this yesterday, I mean, right now. So we just kind of started figuring out how to get it to them and make more slowly, slowly but surely. Now, is this, does this come from an old Appalachian culture? It certainly has been a tradition in Appalachia for, uh, I've, I've actually traced back people that have been brewing with the culture we had back into the 50s in Rappahannock County, but kombucha itself is much older than that. The oldest recorded history is about 3,000 years in the Himalayas. Wow. So when there's a lot of, there's a, certainly a bunch of different folk stories about how it started. Um, <laughs> you know, the... The one that well over three thousand years, yeah. you can imagine how that story grows. <laughs> yeah. So there's ones where the some emperor was sick, and then this doctor brought him this weird fermented tea, and the doctor's name was Kambu, and Cha is the name for tea. That's one story. There's also the one where, you know, the warriors went out on the hunt or whatever, and their wives at home had made tea, and they were gone longer than they thought, and the tea set out for longer, and then turned into something else. And so. Okay. But no wow. one really knows. <laughs> But you're making it today, and it sounds like you're very prolific with this company. Yeah, we've we went from starting with just the Farmersville Farmers Market, Charlottesville Farmers Market, ended up in four retail stores the very next week, and now just over two years later, we're in 60 locations throughout Virginia, including Whole Foods and up in D.C. and Virginia Beach and Richmond and stuff. And wow. Now, kombucha is supposed to have some really good health benefits. Yeah. What are some of those that it's known for? Yeah, kombucha has been known for, I mean, if you look it up on the internet, there's literally a staggering array of things from digestion to liver cleansing to hair to skin qualities. Um, for me personally, I just notice I feel better when I drink it more often. You know, I definitely will say from, per I can say from personal experience that my digestion is much happier when I drink it often, and I just have sort of overall more energy and stuff like that. I mean, it's really, when people ask me about the health benefits of kombucha, I really say it's best to just try it, you know, drink, maybe replace your soda or something like that for just a month and see what it does for you, because mm -hmm. everybody's different. I want to talk a little bit about the process. How do you get, you start with tea leaves, walk us through the process and how you get to the bottle that you're holding. Yeah. <clears throat> so literally we start with, um, we use all green tea for our kombucha and we start with whole tea leaves. We use only organic and fair trade tea. So we steep those leaves in hot water just like you would making a cup of tea at home. And then from there we add organic evaporated cane juice which is essentially 
cane sugar from fair trade and that is then boiled into the tea mixture and then we change you know we adjust the temperature to what we want for the fermentation and then we pump it into these fermenters here and then from there we add our starter that's grown in that other tank there into it so then that's basically it's the same idea as when a brewer pitches yeast into something to make beer it's putting the, the active living culture into it to okay. start the fermentation so that goes through a, what we call the primary ferment and that's you know anywhere from seven to ten days and from there it's put into the bright tanks up in the the walk-in up, up in the driveway and that's where we also add flavors to it from there so we want to add the flavors when it's cold to really preserve the freshness of those that we're using okay. and that from there they sit in there for about another week to really just infuse everything make sure the flavors are blended and we pump them down here to this bottling machine and fill them four at a time by hand <laughs> by hand See? everything by hand um, and it's a family business yeah everybody pitches in don't they? yep absolutely that's amazing now you mentioned adding flavors to it how many varieties of kombucha so, do you make so we have eight different flavors um there's the original which is no flavor that's literally just the kombucha itself the tea and then the tartness it develops and the bubbliness a little bit of sweetness a little bit of tart um and then we have a few relatively simple flavors like the fresh mint where it's literally just mint leaves that are infused into that same kombucha and that extracts the oils out of the mints. We have um, a hops flavor which is, hops are the same flour that are used in beer. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you can use them for a lot of different things and get a lot of different flavors out of it. And that's sort of the same idea where it's just literally infusing the herb fresh whole right into the kombucha. And then we have ones like this, the ginger. Um, this is literally, we take whole ginger root we use that uh, press machine over there to turn that into juice, and then those are put into the kombucha as well. Mm -hmm. So then that's also why, I mean, we do that with, um, the ginger has the pressed juice, the Appalachian Harvest has carrot, apple, and ginger. Um, the mango is a puree, and then that also has chili peppers that we steep and then add to Ooh. it. Um, and so a there's a lot, savory there's a ton of different, one. yeah, and a little bit of yeah, sweet and spicy, that's a okay. really good one. Um, we also even, we have the Sumatra Sunrise, which is a really unique kombucha because it's coffee, honey, and mint, which coffee really? and honey are not things you find in kombucha no. very often. Wow. Um, so that's, and that's made with locally roasted Sumatra from Shendo Jo. Do you have a bestseller? The ginger, the one I'm holding in the my ginger? hand. The ginger, okay. Um, which would be followed closely by the blueberry lemongrass ever since we introduced that this past summer. That's just been, it's, it's kind of neck and neck with the ginger. Right. So it's sort of, they're, they're, they're pretty, sort of different spectrums. You know, the ginger is really spicy and strong flavor, and the blueberry's got that kind of nice fruitiness and mellow, like, lemony flavor. Okay. So. Explain to me a little bit about how the actual fermentation process works. Because in beer, they're trying to build yeast. But in kombucha, you're trying to break it down? Um, well, not exactly. We, we, we are trying to grow the yeast as well, but it's basically, so the kombucha culture is called a SCOBY, which is an acronym for Symbiotic Community of Bacteria and Yeast. So it's symbiotic because what's happening within the ferment is the yeasts are going after like the glucose and the sucrose in the sugars, and, or the, mostly the sucrose, I misspoke, and then they are turning that sucrose into alcohol and carbonation. The bacteria is at the same time are going after that alcohol that the yeast are producing and that's what they are eating. So that's how the bacteria proliferate themselves is by eating the alcohol that the yeast produce, which is also how with the right conditions you can have a non-alcoholic product rather than something with a higher percentage. Right. So now you've got a non-alcoholic product that is full of probiotics. Yep, exactly. Which everyone has heard are <laughs> Super for everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Super for everything. Happy gut, happy life. Peter, where can we find Mountain Culture Kombucha? And do you have a website? Yeah, um, so our website is mountainculturekombucha.com. We also have social media that you can find, both Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under that same name. And then retail locations we have in Charlottesville, Waynesboro, Stanton, Harrisonburg, Richmond, Virginia Beach, and Washington, D.C. We're in all the Whole Foods that are in those locations, as well as Rebecca's and IY and you know health, local health food stores like that in Charlottesville, Market Street Market. Um, we're in some restaurants like Blue Moon Diner, Revolutionary Soups, um, over in Harrisonburg in the Friendly City Food Co-op, Elwood Thompson's in Richmond. Um, and then you know there's some coffee shops and other sandwich shops and stuff thrown in there as well. And all of that from showing up to the 
Charlottesville <laughs> Farmer's Market and saying, let's see if people like this. Yep. Amazing. It's been quite a journey. Well, thanks for having us. I'm going to try a blueberry lemongrass with you here. Please and do. And I appreciate you having us out today. Absolutely. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> yeah. Very good. That's a really good one. Thanks so much, Peter. Yeah, thank you, Amy. We'll be right back. Eggplant is an interesting plant that comes in several varieties and can be very versatile for cooking. Today, Chris Mullins has tips on growing eggplant from the ground up. So today we're going to be talking about eggplants. Now, everybody loves eggplant. It's something that people are starting to cook with more and more. It's uh, real popular in, in different dishes. And they're actually not too difficult to grow. So let's look at some of these and I'll give you some production tips on how you can grow them in the garden. And as you can see, eggplants are a real attractive plant. They're, they're an ornamental almost. They're dark green in color, uh, kind of purplish flowers, really nice, but they also give you great fruit. Uh, one of the, the first production tips I'm gonna give you is make sure that you get your transplants in the ground when there's warm ground. So for most of you, that's gonna be sometime in May, uh, putting them in uh, cold ground, putting these down, just doesn't, doesn't do very well. They, they slow down, they sit. So make sure that soil temperature is up uh, in the 70s, almost 70, before you, uh, before you plant your transplants. Now, when you're putting your transplants in, they need to go anywhere from about 18 to 24 inches apart, and uh, that'll give them enough space. The eggplant, like, unlike tomatoes and peppers, really don't need any trellising. Occasionally, you might find one with a heavy fruit load that you might put a stake beside, but otherwise, you don't have to worry about stakes too much. Now, uh, they do need irrigation. Eggplant, throughout the growing season, are gonna need uh, quite a bit of water. Uh, you can use overhead irrigation, but really that gets the leaves wet and you could have disease problems. I would say uh, drip irrigation is going to be your best bet. Try to put uh, something like drip tape or a soaker hose that you can put down and give them uh, constant water throughout the summer and, uh, and they'll do really, uh, drill, do really well for you. Well, fortunately for the home gardener, there are not a lot of disease problems that affect eggplant. That's a good thing. But uh, there are some insects. And early on, you'll get flea beetles and things like that on the, uh, on the eggplants when they're young, just when you've just put those transplants in the ground. And what you can do is cover the plants with floating ro with a uh, hooped row cover that will protect from, from uh, cold weather, but it'll also exclude those insects from getting on there. And later in the season, you'll get um, caterpillars and beetles that might attack the leaf and make holes in it and you can just apply there a BT product and you can get that type of spray at your local garden center or home improvement warehouse and they'll take care of, of all that. Um, now you've, you're growing this, you've got beautiful fruit on here, you want to harvest it. They are a little prickly around where you harvest so one of the best things to do is take a knife or some scissors and cut the fruit off and you can do that and leave a little bit of the stem on there. What you're also leaving is that cap or calyx on the fruit. And if you leave that on there, it does another, another thing. It'll keep the uh, fruit from drying out too early. So that, that's a good tip right there. There are a lot of varieties out there, a lot of different types. Most of you think of that oblong type that's really dark purple in color. And you know it's ready when it's shiny, by the way. When it gets real shiny, it's time to harvest it. But anyway, most of you are most familiar with that, that purple colored uh, oblong fruit, but there are white colors out there, there are striped colors, there are also more long shapes, uh, the oriental types like uh, Ichiban and Tiny Fingers, and those oriental varieties are going to be very productive, probably anywhere from 12 to 15 fruit per plant. So you're going to have lots and lots of eggplant to, uh, to make dishes with. Well, for more information about production of eggplant, please contact your local county extension office. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins, and we'll see you next time. Taking a look at the Ag Calendar, Solar on the Farm 16 will be held March 30th at the Wood Grill Buffet in Harrisonburg and on March 31st at the Thomas House in Dayton. Find out how to put solar power to work on your farm. There will be presentations by Farm Credit, USDA, and NRCS. And special guest David Yutze of Wincrest Holsteins, the largest residential solar project in Virginia, will speak at the March 30th event. Registration is limited to 30 people each day. To register, please contact Greg Yost. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org.